Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. Como están? Welcome to our Spanish service. I'm just kidding. Um, my name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads Church. Pastor Joel is in Florida, I think, right now at a wedding, and he's going to be doing some traveling and speaking. He'll be back in a couple of more weeks as we begin a new series in November entitled Savage Jesus. Don't want to miss that. But uh, today we are continuing our series on It's Complicated, and we're looking at the subject of marriage. Just, just out of curiosity, how many guys are married here? How many guys want to be married Look around the room. Good. Yeah, back there. <laughs> Whatever. Um, little Johnny, his parents were in a very uh, uh, difficult predicament. They wound up in the hospital, and because uh, Johnny's dad had some, you know, some complications in his body. And so they go to the hospital, and um, the report concerning Big Johnny was not good. So the doctor asked his wife to privately go into a room, and he was going to talk to her. So he, he shuts the door, and he says, I've got some bad news. Your husband is going to die in about a week, and I need to, for you to get, just get preparations together and what have you. He goes, but here's the good news. The good news is I believe that if you go back home and cook him three meals a day, <laughs> what are you laughing at? Cook him three meals a day, pamper him, give him bed, uh, breakfast in his bed, make love to him like you made love to him as many times as you did in that first year, as much as you possibly can. I believe you just do all that and pay attention to him that he could last another year, possibly two more years. And so she just looks at him and nods and they walk out of the room. They walk out of the room. Big Johnny's there. He goes, well, what did he say? What did he say? And the wife said, you're going to die in a week. <laughs> I thought that was cute. The series is, it's, 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 it's complicated, and the title of this morning's message is Marriage is Complicated. And while I'm on this subject, uh, Bill and Denise, could you guys stand up real quick? I just want to give kudos to these guys. These guys lead our marriage uh, enrichment series. And man, I'm telling you, Bill, it's too late to start up, right? It's too late. Okay. So the next time, make sure if you guys are new in a marriage or you're wanting to just rekindle some of the things in marriage, uh, it didn't matter. Wh whichever season that you're in, try to get into that class because the principles taught in that class is absolutely life-changing. So the next go around is probably in 2024, correct? January or so. So make sure and be a part of that. A few years ago, oh, wait a minute, before I get going, a couple things, a couple announcements. One, that QR code that you see there in the back of those seats, uh, that's where you're going to start seeing a lot of the new, the notes. It's the new website that we have. A lot of great information there. It's this where you register a lot of the things. Um, and in, in October the 31st on Halloween, we're going to have a, an outreach for our community, as we call it Fall Fest. Some of you guys have been a part of it. But this year, we've got a lot of great things planned. And Abby needs some more help. Abby She's our children's director, and she is uh, driving that. She's the point person for that, but she needs a whole lot more help. And for all of you guys, we almost uh, ran out of candy last year, so make sure and grab some candy and bring that over the next few weeks, specifically um, sweet tarts, okay? And so we'd appreciate that very, very much, because that's a blessing to me, I mean to everyone, to all the kids. <laughs> And then the last thing is men. Uh, we've got a couple more weeks before we get into our men's encounter, 2024. And Pastor Joel and I, man, we have got some great, and Pastor Jeremiah's got some great content for, for you guys. I believe when you, you leave this particular uh, encounter this year, you're going to have the tools necessary. One, you're going to have more self-awareness of who you are and what's going on in your life as a, as a man. Our purpose as men, our band of brothers, is to build better men. So we are strategically putting together material to help you become a strong man in your home. Wives, get the $200 somehow. Sell your dog, sell cats, sell whatever you need to do. Get him over there, okay? Now, we don't want money to be an issue. So if you just have a desire, you know you should be there, you feel like you need to be there, just sign up, just register. Put 20 bucks down, put 50 bucks down, whatever you have. I just need your name there so I can make preparations to to minister and to be ready for you guys over there. It's a fantastic place in Wimberley, and I really encourage you. On the last night of that particular um, encounter, we have the former lead singer for the Newsboys named John James, who is just a 
a radical guy. He's a funny guy, but he'll be here Sunday morning too, ministering to us and the, and the family here. But we are in this series entitled, um, uh, It's Complicated, and we're looking at the subject of marriage this morning. A few years ago, hey babe, can I get a water please? Uh, I ran, have you guys ever seen the movie called Juno? It's a fantastic movie. Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Juno is a, a movie about a teenage girl who winds up getting pregnant. She goes to an abortion clinic, and th- she's thinking that that's the route she wants to go, d- realizes that that's not the route she wants to go. And so she said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and have the child, but I'm probably going to give the child up for adoption. So she goes and interviews a couple, and in an interview in that couple, she realizes that that, mar- that couple's marriage is in disarray. It's not good. It's very complicated, and it's not doing good at all. She lives with her dad and stepmom. Because her mom and dad, that particular marriage was a disaster, and it was not good. So she didn't have a real good example there. And um, so she and her, her daddy, her, what do you call it, daddy boy, boy, boy daddy, daddy. What is, baby daddy, here you go, sorry. <laughs> her baby daddy. <laughs> um, her baby daddy <laughs> is not a really good baby daddy. And so that relationship is in turmoil. And so she goes back, and she's going to have a conversation with her dad. And it's a, it, you know, she's going to tell him that she's pregnant. And man, I love the way dad responded. I think dad responded in a very profound way. And it was a good, solid way to communicate this to her. But in that little conversation, Juno makes a statement and asks a question. It's a question I think that every single person, probably every single one of us have asked this or are going to ask this at some time or another in our lives. I know every single person, adult person has probably asked this, college person has probably Ask this, and it goes something like this. She goes up to him, she goes, hey dad, I guess I wonder sometimes if people ever stay together for good, like people in love. Dad, I just need to know that it's possible for two people to stay happy together forever. Isn't that a great question? Is it even possible that two people can spend, based upon what I've seen you and mom, based upon this couple that I'm you know, interviewing, Based upon everything that's around me, I just want to know, I just need to know, is it absolutely possible for such a thing to take place while I'm on this earth, staying in love? Is it even possible? And how many guys know that falling in love is very easy? All you need is a body and a heartbeat. But staying in love is complicated. And it's work, isn't it? I mean, it is. Are you guys on it? Right, let's be honest. I was at Starkey Park the other, the last couple of weeks. I'm out there playing golf, um, and I'm in, in behind the clubhouse. Ever since we had our, our Band of Brothers golf tournament, I got these clubs, and I've been messing around with them, trying to figure out how to be better at it. And it's frustrating, but anyways, <laughs> it's kind of like marriage. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm in the back, and um, there's a picture of where I'm at. Some of you guys know where this is at. And, you know, that putting green area, that chipping thing. And I'm out there putting and I'm out there. And I'm sitting on this table and I just start smiling. I start laughing uh, because some memories were flooding my heart. And I'm laughing. If anybody had seen me in that time, they're probably thinking, man, he's probably doing pretty good. He's probably making hole in one or whatever. But that wasn't it at all. So the reason I was smiling and I had my heart was just so cheery is because I was in memory lane. And years ago, when we were kids, that same place was our local swimming pool. You guys remember that? Yeah. Anybody remember that? Raise your hand. Yeah. And it wasn't that, you know, that swimming pool was awesome. I didn't have a fantasies over the swimming pool. But what I remembered was right across this fence on that sidewalk, when I walked down there as a, a 14-year-old, was the first time I fell in love and I met Natalie. She was coming out of the pool like right here. <laughs> and it's like, Bo Dare coming out. I'm like, oh. I got to, and I ain't going to show you that picture either. I don't think we had cameras back then. But um, uh, I, it was just flooding my heart, and I was just laughing and, and, and thinking to myself, like, man, that was a long time ago. But here's the beautiful thing. Here's the point. The point is this, is that even though it's been years, the landscape of this area has all changed. I mean, holes have been dug, and grass has grown, dirt's been put in, all this, all this kind of stuff. It's a different landscape, but the one thing that did not change, and no one can ever take away from me, is the memory that I had the time when I first fell in love. 
And I think it's a beautiful end from that time till this time. Man, it's been work. It's been complicated. It's been difficult, but it's been worth it. And yes, it is possible for two people to get together and stay in love. Right, babe? Okay. (laughs) You know, it takes 30 minutes as a pastor. It takes 30 minutes to perform a ceremony. But it takes about 30 years to make a marriage. It takes about 30 years to make a home or, or more, some less or more. And right now, Natalie and I have been together 30, we are celebrating our 39th year in marriage. Now, is it possible? Yes, but based upon the statistics and all the stuff, the the information that we have, it's probably not probable. Why? Because marriage is like a three ring circus. You got your engagement ring, you got your wedding ring, and then you got suffering. (laughs) And I say that as a joke, but I also say that with a lot of truth. Because I think today, in our today's age, people aren't willing to take on necessary suffering, the necessary suffering that it takes to have an enduring relationship in a home. It does. We're going to have to learn how to sacrifice certain things. You can't have your way all the time. And it, yes, it's true. (laughs) I don't know if you learned that or not. And by the way, let me just say this up front. If you've been married, this is your second marriage or third marriage or whatever that is, please don't walk out of here feeling condemned. This is not about that at all. I just want you to know, look, the past is a past. You can start over, but you can start over with this principle that I'm about to share with you this morning. And I think you will be, you'll be successful in whatever uh, your future holds for you, but it will involve necessary suffering. It's never been easier to fall in love I think there's 150 or 1,500 different organizations available that will help you do that. You give them a little bit of money, you throw a profile in there, get your old, you know, uh, uh, photo when you had a six-pack or whatever, put that on there, and they would try to match you with someone else. Never been easy to fall in love. Like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, I think I love that. You don't even know them. It's just because they look good. That, that six-pack will turn into a keg one day. <laughs> I promise you. And another reason why it's never been so difficult or a reason why it's been, it's so difficult to stay in love is because um, we've never been modeled. It's never been modeled to us. For most of us, true romantic relationship has never been modeled to us. You might have, you know, my mom and dad were married 60 plus years. And even though, man, I respect that and I value that, there was a lot of hard times, just like any other relationship that they had difficulty in. If there's one thing that I know for sure, and I, didn't, I'm, I forgot to tell dad this, I learned from my father is learning how to put someone else first and sacrifice. Talk about necessary suffering. Man, I've seen that firsthand in my, father, in my home. And it's a beautiful thing. But even over the span of all these years, there's all kinds of stuff that took place. And most of us have not been modeled a good, solid, romantic, healthy relationship in our lives. For most of us, here's some of the things we've been modeled. Do unto others as they deserve to be done unto. Or do unto others as they do unto you. Do that to me, I'm going to do that to you. Or do unto others as your mood says it should be done. Or do unto others to get them to see things your way. Or you do unto others to wear them down enough so that you can get your way. So a lot of these things have been modeled to us. And most of us, here's what happens. We usually adopt those things that have been modeled before us. So if we're honest with ourselves, we come into a relationship that should last forever. We come in with a deficit. And the things that we are trying to pull in and we we adopt some of the things that we've seen, we try them and we realize that that didn't work. So we're trying to figure this thing out, and I get it. And so another reason why is because there's some smart people that came up here recently, well, it's been a few years, and they just started describing to you and I what a true healthy relationship looks like. And they came up with all these words and all this list that for me, it just, it just tears my brain off. It's like it's impossible for me to think all that, that I'm supposed to give that to Natalie every single day. Here's a portion of that list. For instance, a healthy, strong relationship needs respect, encouragement, comfort, security, support, acceptance, approval, appreciation, attention, affection, and candy. (laughs) I just can't think of all that stuff, right? 
All I know is that the first embrace and that first hug has now turned into a stranglehold. All I know is that when we first met, the pillow we used to sit and lay down, you know, both, both heads would lay on the same pillow. Now, the pillow has become a dividing wall in the middle of the bed. <laughs> Stay away on that side. When you see that pillow here, don't cross over. Anybody ever been there? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> <clears throat> and also, culture, our culture, whether you see it or not, realize it or not, uh, has a very low threshold of pain. I mean, it's easy for them to get out. If you don't make me happy, I'm out. Anybody know people like that? If I'm not happy, then I chose the wrong person. And if I chose the wrong person, I can re-choose somebody else. And it's easy to press the reset button or press a reboot button rather than just keep your boots on and finish the mission that God has called you to be on with your mate. Amen. But it's going to take necessary suffering. You can clap at any time that you want to, okay? Because this is, all, this is going to be great truth. And so, so whatever happened to I do till death do us part? Whatever happened until in sickness and in health and, and for rich or for poor? What, whatever happened? We don't, you know, actually, people nowadays, as I'm doing ceremonies and preparing for them, they're asking me to rewrite their wedding vows. When I first met you, this is what I did. It's all emotion. It's like, hey, what about this part? We don't need to put that part on there. Why? Because it's easy to get out then. You want a contract. You don't want a covenant. Don't shout me down. (laughs) But it's into this difficulty, into this chaos that we can all identify with, into that tension that Jesus comes and he speaks into that culture. He speaks into that difficulty in a relationship. And he says some most amazing words in all of scripture that gives us the foundation for an enduring relationship. I mean, seriously. And when you hear me talk about this here in just a few minutes, you're going to be like, really? That's it? That, that, that's all? That's all you got, Pastor? You just didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare, did you? It's so easy, and it's something that you've heard before that sometimes we just miss it. And I want us to remind ourselves of what exactly Jesus talked about right here. But before I unveil that, I'm going to share with you Three principles that Natalie and I have owned that we have learned over the 39 years and 44 years of being together. Is that okay? And you can pay $25 later, okay? (laughs) A lot of blood, sweat, and tears in these little three things. But man, I'm telling you, finally, I think I get some of it. The first one is this. First one is um, you marry a person, not marriage. You marry a person, not marriage. And what I mean by that, a lot of people are committed to the marriage. But behind that I do is an individual with a name. Her name is Natalie. Natalie has needs. Natalie has desires. Natalie has dreams. And I'm not in it to win it just because of marriage. If you're just in it for a marriage sake, then eventually that's going to wear out. It's gonna, it's gonna, you're going to get tired, you're going to get bored, and while you see him coming in the door, you're going out the back door. It's unsustainable, but always remember that that person, that individual has a name with certain needs, and you're called to serve and to put them first, regardless of how you feel or not feel. You have to understand, Natalie and I have been together, this is our 39th year, 38.5 of those years have been together as a follower of Jesus. 30 of those years that we've spent together, I have spent as a lead pastor somewhere here, or just here or in New Braunfels. It's only been a handful of those years that we uh, came together as um, not followers of Jesus. And so we have learned a lot. There's been a lot of pain in our relationship growing up as a child. But there's also been imparted to us a little bit of wisdom. I just kind of want to share that with you. But the one thing that I had to switch is like, hey, I married not marriage. I married Natalie with certain needs. And now I start to recognize this is her history. This is some of the background. And it's like, oh, man, I see that now. And so now everything that I have, everything that I am, I try to understand what that is, put myself in her position, and then try to figure out how can I meet and serve that area in her life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's one of them. 
<clears throat> the second one is this. Cheat on your work and not your family. Cheat on your work. And what I mean by that is this, is that every, in, in a relationship, what usually happens, you know, we have, we make promises. There's certain dreams that we have together. And um, when we have children, two children, three children, five children, <laughs> there's, we want to be involved. We need to be involved in their lives. And when we make promises and then we back out on some of those promises, it's as if though you are telling your family or your spouse or your kids to hold on to a rock. Let me see that, baby. Can you come up real quick? We made a commitment to have a date night every Thursday night or every Friday night at one time. So, yes. Oh. So we started doing that, and it was amazing. I'm amazing. She was amazing. It was fun. And then for a little while, I'd have to make a phone call. It's like, hey, babe, I'm going to have to cancel date night. Why? Well, because some stuff came up in work, and I just got to go talk to this family about their marriage. Oh, okay. The rock was placed on her lap, and it started getting a little heavier. Now, in the beginning, she was willing. She understood. Stuff happens. Things happen. We get it. And then um, I was like, oh, she didn't get mad at me. Cool. Well, I could probably do it again. I'm not wanting to. But over a period of time, not only did I do that to her, then I would make a commitment to my children. I'll be there at the ball game. And sometimes they would, you know, I've got three daughters, so they were in sports and all this stuff, and they would practice, and they would get themselves ready so that dad could be a part of that experience. Oh, yeah, I'll be there Saturday morning. Saturday morning comes around. They've been practicing all month long, and then I got a call. It's like, hey, sweetie, I can't be there. I'll go to the next game. And all of a sudden, I placed the rock it became heavy in her life, but she's mom, and it's getting heavier in her life. Does it make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? And it gets heavier and heavier because what I rightfully should be giving to them, I'm giving it to someone else, and this rock is getting heavier and heavier, and eventually what will happen, that rock will drop, and you and I, is there, is there a thing? Okay, good. And it's loud. That wasn't that loud. Sorry. Yeah. You okay? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You have a seat. Right. Thank you. Can I take my yes, you can take your rock. <laughs> I was hoping there was no glass in there. I was like, I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> and even though in the beginning she's willing, eventually an attitude comes. Eventually, they're saying things back with you with an attitude. You're, you're wondering, like, what's going on? Well, it, may, it might have not have been something that you were saying to her at that time. Then it was something that you were saying to the kids. And the empty promises all of a sudden put a heavier, heavier weight. And emotionally, they began to get drained. And finally, they just got fed up. And then whenever you see that rock... Their mental capacity and their willingness is now emotionally, they're exhausted emotionally. They just can't do it anymore. And it seems when that rock drops and you hear that noise from your spouse, it seems as though it was insignificant. It was just, I just said no for this. But you didn't realize that that, that no was your 17th no over a period of 12 months. And they were just done with it. And so that's the principle we've learned that if you're going to cheat, you're going to cheat on your work and not your family. Especially when excuses like this come in. Like, honey, we had this vacation plan, but, man, I really, I really needed this, this guitar or this drum set because it'll make me a better musician so that I can provide for my family. You get it, right? Yeah? Okay. I get it. Or whatever that scenario is in your life. The rock dropped. And my eyes were open one evening when I came home and um, I got a call to go back to the office to an event. You know, that's one of the reasons why it's, it's hard for me to, to think about growing a larger church. We took that church from about 800 or so to about 4,000 people. And I said, man, I never want to be a part of a machine again because we were a program-driven church and I had to be careful not to allow this church to become a program-driven church because we had to be at every event, 
in every area of ministry. I come home to have dinner, and while I'm having dinner, I get the phone call, I need to go back. And so I have to leave, and I'm walking out. And as I'm walking out, I could hear the voice of one of my daughters say, why is God taking Daddy away again? But man, that just shattered me. Immediately, I knew that not only was these kind of decisions impacting my my spouse, it was impacting my whole family. It was was impacting who I was as a man and who I was as a father, who I was as a husband. And I couldn't take that back. And I'm asking you, don't let that rock drop. Because on the other side of that rock, dropping could be a lot of damage to that child or a lot of damage to your relationship as a husband. What rock are you asking your family to hold on to? That's number two. Man, I didn't mean for it to be that serious. Chill out. (laughs) The third thing I learned, and this is a great, great thing that we learn in a principle, is this. Put her before me, especially after three. And what I meant by that is that so often, you know, you're drained. You're pouring everything out. You're putting out fires, you're ministering, you're doing all this kind of stuff. So you're tired as they are tired as well. And when I would come home, all I wanted to do was just to sit down, chill, relax, have dinner and pass out and watch the game or something. And I started realizing that when I was coming home, all I was seeing was what was not done. And my kids, you know, the the socks were there and their shoes were there. The bike was over here. And I was just making the first 60 seconds was negative as I came home. And so next thing I knew, after a period of weeks and months of doing that, when I would come home, I wouldn't see the kids. I would still see the stuff, but the kids would start going into their rooms. And my wife started going over here to this other room. And I realized that, man, I've got to flip a switch here. And man, the Lord showed me, and through some counsel and stuff with some friends, it's like those first 60 seconds are so vitally important. So as I had to reframe my thinking, as I'm driving home, you got to suck it up, buttercup. And your day begins after three. Your day just begins. You, gotta, you can't uh, afford to have the, you give them your leftovers. Your day begins on your trip home. And whenever you see them, you pour into them, and how is your day? All that's so awesome. You just invade that space and you get into their world. Even though you're emotionally, you know, at a withdrawal, you just got to make a deposit again. Does that make sense? So you put her before me, after three. Now, I know now people come home real late now, so it might be five or seven, whatever it is, create your own statement. Put her before I, especially after five or whatever. And the the, the point is that on your way home, you have to put them first. Those are the three things that we've learned, and I think it's been a blessing to us, and it's helping us, and we still have a long ways to go, but we are happy, and we are blessed, we are encouraged, and we still argue. We still have disagreements, right, babe? Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Cheers. You can see, tell my grandson. Uh, you can let him know. This is all the inside scoops. Tell our staff. They know. But we have made a commitment that we're not going to let anything this world has to offer, nothing. I'm the only one that can be her husband. If she leaves me, I will follow. <laughs> I'm the only one till death do us part that can be a dad to my girls. I don't care they're 80 years old. I'm still your dad, little girl. (laughs) Not like in an authoritative way, but in a loving, man, I believe in you way. Make sense? It's a unique role only I can have. As far as pastoring, you'll have another pastor one day. But the only unique role I have out of those three relationships as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, those two are only unique to me. And so why would I give up what's unique to me to someone who's going to do that later on? I can't do that. And so, man, we just, it just takes a little bit of focus. So back to Jesus. What is Jesus saying? Thank you for asking. 13th chapter of Jesus, of Jesus, of John. Now, here's a beautiful thing. I love this context because this context in John 13, 
I think it's one of the most difficult moments in the story of our master. I think it's the most difficult moment emotionally. I think it's the most difficult moment he had as uh, he was on this earth. And in this particular moment, he just, he, he was right in the middle. It's, it's a context of, of um, the Lord's Supper. That's where it's at. But he had just spent three years of pouring into these disciples. And right here in the context of this passage of scripture, he was just experiencing a betrayal from Judas. In just a few short minutes and hours, he would not only experience the betrayal from Judas, he'd also experience rejection from all of his disciples or most of them. He would also experience an abandoning from his heavenly father. And he would also experience public humiliation from the religious leaders of that day. It would be church hurt. Forsaken by his, his, uh, um, his disciples, betrayed by his friend, publicly humiliated by the religious folks, and his dad wouldn't even be there. And it's into the chaos of that most disturbing, most difficult time in those relationships that Jesus speaks this key ingredient that will help you have an enduring relationship throughout your whole life. This is what he says in John 13, 34. He says, hey, listen, a new commandment I'm going to give unto you, that you love one another. How do I do that, Lord? That you, a new commandment, wait, this guy, didn't this guy just betray you? You don't know this, but I'm about to reject you. Your dad's about to leave you. And these guys are about to crucify you. And Jesus knows that. And he says, hey, I'm going to give you something new. You're going to get some guys later on in life. They're going to make a list of how you have an enduring relationship. And it's going to be like a brain fart. It's like, what? But I'm going to give you something that's so simple and so practical that if you just hold fast to this truth, you will make it. He says that you love one another. Well, how do I do that? Well, don't take your cue from anywhere else. Don't take your cue from your parents. Don't take your cue. Here's what I, here I want you to take your cue from. You take it from me. And the example that I'm leaving you right now, that I'm about to leave you in the next few hours to come. He says that you love one another. How? As I have loved you, that you also love one another. In other words, looking back, we can understand. In that moment, Jesus sets aside his rank. He sets aside his rights. He sets aside his own respect. And he lays it down for his bride. He lays it down for his bride-to-be. He lays it down for those relationships. He places the interest of you and I and of those individuals that day before himself. And that's the key to an enduring relationship. It's a choice that you and I have. Later on, the apostle Paul, whenever Jesus leaves and he gives the disciples the mission to go out there into this world, they didn't have a Bible degree. They had an internship with the master himself, but they had one commandment. They didn't have a New Testament. All they had was a promise, a new commandment, that you go love one another as I have loved you. The way I express my love to you, that's where I need you to go do to those individuals that I'm asking you to go and share this message with. Later on, the apostle Paul comes in and he says a real similar thing in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. He says, submit yourself one to another. Do you have that? <clears throat> Out of reverence for Christ. You submit means to place yourself under the authority of another individual. So he says, out of reverence for Christ, out of respect for him, he gave you an example of how you should do this by putting others first. You submit yourself one to another. Another way of saying that, he goes, love unconditionally. Another way of saying that is put someone else first. Put them first over and above your own interests. Objection, your honor. <laughs> they don't deserve it. I agree, you don't either. Objection. I thought it was... An equal thing. There it's 50-50. I said, no, you're not in a contract. You're in a covenant. Amen. Right. There's a lot of objections that are probably true and hard on the flesh. And this is the reason why I said there's necessary suffering that needs to take place in an enduring relationship because you have to learn how to say no to your own self-interest. Marriage is the context that God uses to help you understand how selfish you are. I hate that statement, but it's so true. Marriage is meant not to make you happy, but to make you holy. Come on, amen. Come 
It's the one thing that God has used over and over again to help me become more like him. And it's the one thing that he will continue to use to make me understand who he really is and his love for me. The key to staying in love, in other words, check this quote out. You want to stay in love in your relationship? You stay in love by behaving like you're still in love. It's a passage that says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no fulfillment of this flesh. You stay in love by behaving as if though you're still, you remember whenever you were still in love? What did you do? What you did? I used to walk two and a half miles to go see Natalie. Bleeding with my feet. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just, just to go see her. We used to stay up all night, two, three in the morning. I'm going to hang up. No, you can't hang up. Why? I just want to hear you breathe. <laughs> it's just a crazy, look at back, we're, we laugh at it. But it's like, we, you know, if you want to stay in love, you got to behave like you're still in love. It takes effort. It takes putting your flesh under. It's looking and recognizing her needs, recognizing your children's needs, recognizing your grandson's needs, and putting them first over and above your own needs. That's how you maintain an enduring, lasting, stay in love kind of relationship. Does that make sense? So... What do we do? Thank you for asking. This week, I gave you a little quick application, and I'm missing some stuff on the notes. But here's what I encourage you to do this week. Just take a picture of that. Can you put the application on there? Ask these questions. What's unique to you? What's unique to you that no one else can do in your relationship? You're the only, listen, you're the only husband that should take care of that spouse's needs. You're the only dad your child, is, his senior year only happens one time. I wish somebody would have told me, hey, this is the last time you're going to embrace your daughter and carry her around the mall. Yeah. I wish somebody would have told me that. Yeah. I would have cherished those moments a whole lot more. I would have decreased the damage that I did in their lives emotionally. Yeah. There's only one chance one opportunity. You can't take those things back. All you can do is try to make them up in one sense by pouring more love and putting their interests first over and above for the rest of your life. But what's unique to you that only you, that no one else can do, that only you can do? Then two is what's the rock that you're asking your family to hold on to? Every single one of us here, we have different, we can answer these things in different ways. The point is that if you, if you just, just contemplate and, 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 and ask yourself these things, write these things down because that's unique to you. And somehow or another, I just know how God breathes on these things and he puts those things in your heart and you'll never forget it. Make the adjustment, make the adjustment. I was asking the Lord years ago, God, I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I don't want to be that same guy anymore walking the streets on 123, crying out, asking him, show me what to do. Later on, I asked him a, another question. God, I love you so much. You've done so much in my life. And I'm going to, I just want to do anything that you want me to do. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? You know, two different questions, but he gave me the same answer. The same answer is in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Marcus, love your spouse like I love the church and gave myself for that. I'm not talking about Natalie, but God, I'm talking about your love and my love for you. No, because your, your love for me is best expressed when you pour out all that passion, all that love that you have for me, that you redirected to the one that I gave you to live with and spend with the rest of your life here on this earth. Ah, oh, I get it. Can I take a break from June through August? During football season? No. Ah, dang it. So we've learned how to do that. Here's the, here's the crazy thing. The things that interest me, interest me. I'm most interested in the stuff that interests me. I'm not interested in HGTV. I'm not interested in all the stuff that she's interested in. But I've learned to put myself down. It's like, oh, I want to see that game so bad. It's like, 
And, I, and you know, I'm not interested in a biography. I'm not interested in castles in England. <laughs> but I've learned to lay that down and invade that space. And you know what? I'm, I have more knowledge of it now. <laughs> and not only that, we're planning a trip. I'm spending a bunch of money to go over there now. Seriously, I'm like, what the heck? How does that work? You tricked me. <laughs> Anyways, how am I closing this thing? The last question is this. What's one way I can make love a verb this week? Oh, I forgot to tell you that. The key ingredient for a staying in love is to make love. Pause a verb. You caught that, didn't you? The key ingredient to have sustaining love is to make love. And all the guys are like, yes, I told you, honey. Pause a verb. Action has to happen. Quick last story. It's a story, it's a true story about Brian and, ha- Brian and Haley. Brian and Haley um, were falling in love and they fell in love with each other. They are in Mount St. Helens area. They were so young that she had to ask dad permission in order to get married. And of course, he said yes. And Brian proposed and she said yes. And he was so excited because she said yes. And he would ask her over and over every day. And she kept saying, goes, Brian, I already told you, yes, I will marry you. It's like, okay. And they had dreams together. They had dreams together, you know, making this cabin by the river and along the mountains. And it was just a beautiful dream. And they spelled it all out. So Brian starts getting ready to prepare and make that dream come to pass. He's working where, like in a Christmas, like in a farm. And um, he has to, um, like, you, you have to put, you have to, the trees are on fire and you can't let them get out of hand, otherwise the whole countryside will burn. Forest fire will take place. So you have to make sure and maintain the fires, and if it gets out of hand, you gotta douse them out with a little bit of water. So this one particular day, is actually Christmas, the day after Christmas. He's over there, and one little fire starts getting a little out of hand, so he takes his bucket of water, and he begins to douse that flame um, with this water, but didn't realize that that wasn't a bucket of water, it was a bucket of gasoline. And a big old explosion takes place and it just envelops him, his whole body. He thought he was gonna die, and he almost did die. They had to take him to the hospital, they had to amputate a leg, they had to amputate both of his arms, and his eyes got seared shut, so he was blind now. Over 90% of his body was burned, where the doctors, in order to keep him alive, had to do all the amputation, but they also had to take other skin from other corpse and patch a quilt on him so you can keep the infection down and he could at least have a chance to live. In and out of comas over a period of weeks and months. And and then finally, one day, he's coming in and out of consciousness and he's groggy one morning and he notices that his mom is there and Haley's there that particular morning. And he finally gets the courage to ask a question. The question is, Mom, why don't I feel my, my hands, my arms? And she had to tell him. The son who's had to amputate your arms. Is that the same reason I don't feel my leg? Yeah, son. And that's why I can't see either. Yeah. So in that moment, he realized, Brian realizes that all he is is just a limp, just a stump of a tree just sitting there with no arms, one leg, no eyes to see. The darkest moment of his life and he said when he was experiencing that, that it was in that moment that Haley comes up to him and whispers in his ear, I love you so much. I can't wait to have our house by the river and live our lives fully with one another. And he got upset. He goes, you, what do you mean? You can't say that to me. I can't do that anymore. I can't go fishing with my son. I can't give you that dream. I can't give you a family anymore. But she made a commitment that day to pour back into him and she did what Jesus is telling us to do she exemplified that passage of scripture to put their interest over your own she from that moment forward loved him actually they have children right now you can see them online but she made a commitment to make love a verb and put the interest of his needs over and above hers and they live happily even to this day Falling in love is easy. 
staying in love is not only complicated, it's difficult, but the key ingredient is to make love a verb. Put action to that. And that looks different in every single one of our lives. Isn't that true? Let me pray with you. Father, we are so thankful for the word of God. We thank you that it was in the middle of that chaos. It was in the middle of that hurt and division and dissension that Jesus speaks these words to us. Grace us to be that person, God, in our relationship. And for those of us who have just messed up, Lord God, we thank you for your love and forgiveness. Help us, Lord God, to renew our minds and to be stronger in this area of our lives so that we can give to our spouses and give to our kids what's only unique to us and not set that and leave that for other individuals or leave that to therapy or leave that to toys or leave that to other things. Help us to fill that role in our lives. And we just commit that to you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. 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 Bless you guys. We'll see you next Sunday. We'll continue on this series. It's complicated. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.